IT, forging IT security experts. Secure Ninja. Hey everyone, I'm Alicia Webb with Secure Ninja TV and we are here at Black Hat 2013 at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada. And right now I'm going to be interviewing Josh Thomas, also known as Monk. He is the Applied Research Scientist for Acuvant Labs. Josh, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us because I know you're super busy over the next few days. Great. Definitely. We talked to you last year, which was awesome. So we definitely wanted to follow up. I know you've got a big talk at DEF CON. Tell us about it. Um, so over the past year, I've um, received three grants from DARPA Cyber Fast Track to do um, research and analysis on what advanced um, rootkits and malware, what tricks would be used in the industry um, when you kind of shift from a I'm infecting computers with malware and whatnot to be a botnet to send spam. Um, when you shift that mentality and that business model over to a state sponsored area where you have a lot of money and you have almost unlimited funding. Um, and so the DEF CON talk in general will we'll talk about all my all of my research that I'm doing for DARPA and then just also kind of the business model and impetus of that whole scheme around the world of what state-sponsored malware and rootkits look like, um, how they work. Um, and, and it's really, it, it begins with a financial analysis of everyone thinks O days are sexy and the whole security industry is you know, very interested in ooh, O days are cool and that, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, but when you start looking at it from like a capitalist viewpoint, you realize that if I'm going to spend half a million dollars for an O-Day, that's disposable. Um, at some point that's going to get burned, I'm going to have to buy another one. Um, so what am, I, what am I doing with that money? Mm -hmm. um, and typically what you find out is that that half a million dollars is throwaway compared to the 20 or 30 or 40 million dollars that you've spent in just boring standard software development to do something with it. Um, and so that when you shift to that mentality and you realize now you're, you, you don't have this half million dollar O day that's really cool, you've got a $40 million investment that you want to protect and you want to make sure that nothing ever happens to that and that doesn't become exposed to the world and, and known. Um, and so the DARPA research I'm doing is how do we hide? How do we just deeply hide executing code on a device um, mm -hmm. in ways that just you don't see in day-to-day -day, you know, viruses or exploits or rootkits. I mean, it's it's a different world because the finances and the public image are so important that uh, that needs to be hidden. Um, so I, I started talking to Mudge at, at DARPA and um, ended up getting funded for three projects. The first, um, which I'll speak about at Black Hat, is called NAND Explore, and it is looking at how NAND flash works, which is the memory storage medium that's used in almost all SCADA systems, almost all embedded devices, cell phones, um, solid state drives on laptops. I mean, it is the ubiquitous storage medium nowadays, flash drives and whatnot. Um, intrinsically, the way that hardware works, there's a logical, I won't even say flaw, there, there was an illogical, a logical assumption by the people that designed the hardware, it needs to work this way. Um, but because it works that way, I can take advantage of that in an unintended way and hide data that can't be seen by anything. Um, so if I can get some code running on a device, mm -hmm. I can turn around and hide that to where nothing on the device can see that code anymore or those files. Um, I can also take that same mentality and take advantage of that same uh, logical assumption and just start killing a hard drive. So I don't act to actually hide data. Um, if I'm attacking like some SCADA system that is hooked into an oil pipeline going from you know Texas to Alaska, mm -hmm. um, you know, I can I can start messing with the NAND to slowly make the hard drive just disappear um, to the point where there is no I mean, physically, the hard drive, you know, the, the NAND is still there in the device, but um, 
nothing on that NAND works anymore. Nothing can be seen. You can't restore it because the NAND itself just says, I'm bad, I can't be used anymore. Um, so it went from a, how do I hide, to now, how do I destroy? Um, and I'll also be talking about, since it's not patchable per se, um, how do we try to defend against that type of attack? Um, and, and just the best thing that I can really do for defense, because it's a, it's a hardware flaw that is in billions of devices, mm -hmm. is, is talk to people and just try to inform the community this is, this is what we're up against. Um, and it's, it's not anything that we can't end up protecting against. We just we don't have any tools right now. Um, so I'm releasing open source tools uh, as kind of proof of concepts of how all this stuff works. Um, and hopefully someone can pick it up after that and, and run it to ground and actually um, start moving this, this type of mentality into an AV or something like that, because it's just non-existent. Um, the second, second DARPA project I'm working on is called Clock Locking Beats. Um, and it's looking at how can I run code, um, if I want to hide code that's running on a device, how can I run that code in a way that nothing will see it? <laughs> so I mean, if, you, if you think about how a computer typically works, you have user space, which people log in and do things, then you have the kernel space that controls everything. Um, Clock Locking Beats is looking at how do I run code on the same processor the kernel is running on, but the kernel doesn't even know about it. It's just non-existent. It is a completely separate, it's almost like conceptually adding a second processor into a device solely so I can run wow. an implant or code or whatnot. Um, now I'll be talking about that a little bit at DEF CON. Um, and then the third project I'm working on is um, called Project Burner, and it is Exploring how you can, if you control a device, um, a cell phone or whatnot, what can you do with that device kinetically or physically? Um, so if, if I have a remote exploit to get on someone's cell phone, um, what can I do with that? Can I, make, um, can I make the battery blow up? Can I make you know, the battery dump all of the power to the main processor and fry it? Um, mm -hmm. It's really looking at just what capabilities you have to interact with the physical world through software um, on a device uh, with the intent of, you know, can I break it? Like, right. if I'm trying to protect that $40 million investment and I don't want that to get found, um, can I just kill the device? Like, um, so the, the NAND work is, can I hide it to the point that not even good forensic software can find it? Um, uh, Clock Locking Beats is looking at how can I run it's so no user or no typical antivirus can find it. And then Project Burner is really taking a step further and going, OK, um, worst case scenario, something happened. I still don't want to have that ever become public. So my, let me just, let's just catch it on fire. I mean, um, you, in reality, you're not going to catch a phone on fire. But you can get fairly close. And you can definitely destroy the phone. Wow, um, remotely. Uh, you yes. can hack into someone's phone remotely. And then destroy it. And destroy it. Mm -hmm. So it'll never, it'll never boot again. Um, it'll never charge again. Uh, even if you take it apart, um, depending on how I do it, even if you take it apart and try to pull the memory out of it, you know, physically desolder the memory chip and put it somewhere else, mm -hmm. um, all of that data is gone, wow. and the phone is just—it's a paperweight. Right. Um, that's crazy. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's it's been a fun mind blowing, year. definitely. Yeah. yeah. So. Lots of interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, what kind of impact do you hope like sharing this information will have on the cybersecurity community? Um, I'm hoping it just kind of, it, it, I mean, if I have my pipe dream, it, it may help to change some of the dialogue we have between, um, you know, offense is great and it's really interesting and no days are sexy and everyone likes to talk about them and no one really talks defense because it's, it's not as sexy. Um, right. So, you know, Maybe if we stop looking at the threats that we're facing today in a defensive mindset, but start looking at, okay, what are really advanced threats um, that we don't see on a daily basis unless you're in some governmental or big corporation realm? Right. Um, you know, how do we defend against those? That does get really interesting, at least, uh, I mean, it kind of academically, kind of, you know, applied research type of a thing. But I'm, um, I'm hoping that people 
come away with just a, an interest in, in how the game changes when you start adding a lot of money into it. Right. So when we spoke to you last year um, at Black Hat, it was the day before DEF CON when you mm -hmm. were about to release the code for your project called SPAN. Mm -hmm. um, how did that end up going? Uh, it, went, it went really great. Um, SPAN is, is actually still an ongoing project. Um, the whole point of SPAN is, is smartphone ad hoc networking. So it's, it's how can you take over a phone um, or when you lose connectivity um, with either cell towers or Wi-Fi or whatnot, um, how can you still communicate between two phones? So we, um, we released the source to do the full open source mesh networking on, on smartphones. Um, and we've continued that work uh, for the past year. Um, the open source community has really taken a liking to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been still working with uh, my old team at MITRE that's still running the project officially, and then I'm lead developer on the open source half. Um, we've gotten quite a few developers from around the world that are interesting in helping and contributing to that code. Uh, we also have a lot of academic institutions around the world that are um, that I've been working with, people like working on their PhD thesis and whatnot that um, want to use SPAN as a platform to do further research. And so I, I've been um, trying to help uh, just further that cause because um, there's there's a lot of research left to be done to get mesh networking it's we proved it was viable mm -hmm. um, but to actually make it viable and really really useful usable um, on a day-to-day -day basis there, there there's some work that needs to be done so I've, I've been working with um, academia and uh, industry and government agencies and just pretty much anyone I can get to talk to that's interested in this project to try to help them take it on. Right. Um, so it's it, still ongoing. It's very much still ongoing. Um, I just I had some great conversations last week about um, trying to do uh, mesh networking in like third world countries, mm -hmm. um, which is was not the original impetus of the project, but it, it's a great uh, use for that project and technology. Definitely. So. It seems like it. And run over the technology again, the mesh networking and SPAN and how it all works. Okay, so um, in general, all, all cell phones have a Wi-Fi chip. So I'm, for Project SPAN, I'm literally just taking the Wi-Fi chip over um, and saying, you have the option of talking to the cell towers like you normally do. You have the option of talking to Wi-Fi like you normally do. Mm -hmm. But if neither of those exist, you can also use that Wi-Fi chip to do a ad hoc network between um, you know, phone A, phone B, C, D, E. Like any phones that are around you now create this dynamic net, this dynamic kind of organic network. Um, so you can still share data between all the phones and whatnot. Um, and that's the code we released. Um, there's a couple of other projects that have also been doing similar work. The difference of ours is that we are at a very low level in the kernel that we're doing this. So any application you have on the phone uh, that you would typically have installed on your phone just will work like it normally would. You don't have to custom write applications that are mesh networking aware. Right. Um, so uh, that's that's where it was last year, and we're still just doing active development, active trying to help people um, push that technology further. Excellent. Um, well, Monk, I know you've got a lot to do preparing for your Black Hat talk, so I will let you get back to it. But thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us again. Thank you. I appreciate it and enjoyed it. Definitely. And I would love to follow up with you next year about everything that went on this year and what you're going to do the next year. I hope to be back. Definitely. Keep good luck with all your stuff. Cool. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks for watching, everyone. Make sure you like us on Facebook, follow on Twitter, keep up to date on everything Secure Ninja TV is filming here at Black Hat. Thanks for watching. I'm Alicia Webb. Secure Ninja Shorts are brought to you by SecureNinja.com a world leader in information security and IT training and certification. Our master instructors will help build you into a highly skilled and marketable security professional. SecureNinja.com, forging IT security experts.